<laughs> you guys are like, should I clap? What do I do here? Okay, I'll clap. When in doubt, clap it out. I just made that up, so that was great. Well, y'all are looking good today. I know you can't help it. I know you can't help it, but you are looking good today. Great to be with you. And I trust that the Lord would speak to you if he has not already today. I trust that you're engaging with him and engaging with one another because we are a family. Do you know that? We don't have physical, biological family present in Rockford. And God has gifted us, as he's gifted each of us, family in each other. And so remember that, right? We are a family. And so when we get together, it is family time in the living room of God or what have you to uh, gather around worship, to love one another, to connect with him through his word and see what God will do among us. So as we have been beautifully set up, um, today we are again turning to the Gospel of John. So if you have a Bible with you or a device, we all have them in one form or another, please go ahead and turn to John chapter 3. Now I've been having a say over and over again, and not today though, the key verse of this chapter. And so when you are reading the, uh, excuse me, of the whole book, when you are reading the entire book of John, understand the intent or the reason why John is writing this gospel to us. He is presenting it as an evangelist would present it to people who have not heard. And time and time and time and time again, over and over, John brings forward evidence and teaching and testimonies and miracles so that you and I would understand who this Jesus is and we would believe not about him but believe in him. And in so doing, you and I and whoever puts their faith in Jesus will have new life in him. Jesus is the center point of all creation. Jesus is the cornerstone of the entire uh, Bible. And really, it is all about him. So if you notice the title for this morning, if you have printed versions, and there are ones online as well for those of you who are at home. And by the way, if you are at home, we're doing a communion today as well, so that's going to be at the very end. So you're going to need to get some elements where you are together. And right at the end of the service, we're going to um, observe communion. And so if you look at the title, and if you're not a math person, you're like, what is that, right? So it's Jesus is greater than, I remember this from second grade, right? The alligator eats what's greater. Yes, you're laughing. You should laugh at this. This is how we remember things, okay? Jesus is greater than me. And so if you remember, if you've been with us, right, we've been observing the conversation that Jesus was having with the Reverend Dr. Nicodemus, the teacher of Israel. And in John chapter 3, we see this amazing interaction as Jesus instructs uh, Nicodemus as to what it is to be born again. And we've talked about that in the past. Now, John the Apostle, who's writing this, is following along with Jesus. The scene turns. And now we're going to see Jesus and his disciples, and Jesus has been gathering disciples, go out into the Judean countryside. And there's going to be like dueling baptisms that are happening. And so John points to us, and I want us to identify what Margie talked about, two main things, and I have some sub points, okay? One is our identity and calling, and we'll see this as John talks about him. We'll see some things about us and our calling and what God has asked us and equipped us and called us to do. And then we'll see Jesus' identity and calling as he puts in his thesis about believing in him. And then what I want us to recognize is the overlay or, or the interplay of our calling and identity with Jesus' calling and identity. And how we relate to him and how he relates to us so that 
as we go away today, my hope is that we will have this phrase. I'm going to read it. I'm going to turn on my iPad. There it goes. I'm going to do this. Maybe. Don't you love technology? Hello. Okay, here we are. What do I want to say? It's probably on the screen, perhaps. Maybe. Or maybe not. <laughs> so that you may be most satisfied in him, it's the end goal, and that he, which is Christ, may be most glorified in you. Okay? That's a, that's a, that's a packed phrase. Okay? I'm going to put it, oh, there it is. There we go. God is most glorified in us when we are most satisfied in him. And we'll see that again at the very end. So that we would recognize that our satisfaction, um, his glory comes when we are satisfied in him. A lot to that statement, but we're going to go through this passage, and this should be coming up to the surface, okay? So we're going to pick up the story in John chapter 3, uh, starting with verse 22. I'm going to read a bit, we're going to talk about it, we're going to see your points, and we're going to go through the rest of this chapter this morning. So John 3, starting with verse 22. It starts this way. After this, okay, that was a conversation Jesus had with Nicodemus, Jesus and his disciples went into the Judean countryside. They were in Jerusalem, and now they're moving out to the countryside. And he remained there with them and was baptizing. Now John, this is John the Baptist, was also baptizing at a non near Salim because water was plentiful there. And people were coming and being baptized. Verse 24, for John had not yet been put into prison. And by the way, spoiler alert, John does go to prison by continuing his ministry, and he then is beheaded. Okay, so this was before that point, setting up the context. So since John the Baptist and Jesus last met, Jesus again had been collecting or calling disciples to himself. Now they were baptizing. So Jesus and his baptizing, and John 4, we'll see this, Jesus himself wasn't baptizing, but his disciples were baptizing. They moved up the river and they were baptizing. Now, John was still fulfilling his ministry, and he and his disciples were baptizing somewhere in the vicinity. And people were streaming from all points of the nation of Israel to hear John, to um, um, ask for forgiveness of their sins. And now there were true two groups of people. Okay, so this is what is happening in this scene. And this is what I want us to see. This is the main first point. It is your identity and calling. And we're going to get it from John's words here. Okay, so here we are. Jesus, is his star is rising. John the Baptist is still ministering. And they're set here in the Judean countryside. Let's continue to read in verse 25. Now, a discussion arose between some of John's disciples and a, few, and a Jew over purification. Okay? We don't know the details of this, but they were arguing about how one can be purified. And part of that was in the baptism. But there was an argument taking place by one person about this issue of purification. And they came to John the Baptist, and they said to him, Rabbi, he who is with you across the Jordan, this is talking about Jesus, to whom you bore witness, look, he is baptizing. And all are going over to him. So this was a tension point, right? Someone came up to John the Baptist. Hey, John, I want to let you know that um, the preacher that you pointed to, the one named Jesus that you bore witness, he's here. And more people are going to him than are coming to your revival services. They're heading over to his church across the river and not yours, right? And so how was John going to respond to this, right? And by the way, how would you respond to this, right? When you see your star that had been shining bright all of a sudden start 
to fade and dim as a new person was coming on the scene. Okay, It's like being a NFL quarterback and being traded to the Jets and someone else is coming up. Did I just say that? I did. <laughs> Goodbye. Okay. Or your understudy as a actress or actor, right? You are the lead role. All of a sudden, you're getting more attention and more fame. And as more eyes and more attention is turned to them, there is less for you. And so this was what was brought to the attention of John, saying, hey, the guy that you promoted, right, the guy that you said, look, here is the Lamb of God, he's like up the street, and more people are going to him, John. What do you have to say about that? Well, let's read about how John responded. Verse 27. Now, John answered, a person cannot receive even one thing, unless it is given him from heaven. Now you yourselves bear me witness that I said, I'm not the Christ, but I have been sent before him. What a remarkable response by John the Baptist. So this is our first sub-point on this. It is... You have been given an identity and calling, okay? Where am I getting this? Well, hopefully right from the text, okay? So again, sometimes people hearing the news of someone else's success or someone else's life or someone else's gifting and calling, they, we respond like, insecure junior hires, right? Inside each of us is an insecure little boy or little girl, right? At least inside of me somewhere, right? Often we think, well, wait a second. I want the attention. I want the fame. I want the credit. I've worked so hard to get to this point. And we'll see this type of jealousy all throughout school grounds, all throughout <laughs> workplaces, all throughout families, and even in churches, okay? These things happen. And John, in recognition of what God was doing in the life of someone else through a theological lens, said what is true. This man, Jesus, right, this other person, he is fulfilling his calling. And what he is receiving and doing at this time has been given to him by heaven. Okay? So which tells us, and this is my sub-point under the main point, you and I, each of us, have been given both an identity and a calling. And you can say, well, you know, it's only those who are in full-time vocational ministry who have a calling of God. That's nonsense, okay? You all, right, are called by God to honor Him, to magnify Him in and through your life in every pursuit that you go after. I'm the encourager, I am the equipper, I do have a calling that, that places me as a pastor, and you are all ministers, do you know that? Your gifting is different than my gifting, my gifting is different than your gifting, but scripture is clear that each one of us have received something from God. And I want you to pause and, and think about that. How has God equipped you? What has God given you? Because what you have and every good gift is from the Father above, right? He doesn't skip anyone on gift-giving day, right? He doesn't skip over you. You have gifts and calls and identity. John understood his role. 
and he recognized what was happening in the life of Christ at this point, or the life of another was happening because God was working and blessing and using another person. And that did not make John insecure, right? He says, hey, what is happening in his life is because heaven is working there. And then he says, right, hey, I told (laughs) y'all, I'm not the Christ, right? He recognized what his role was. He's like, hey, I am the voice. I am the one that prepares the way. I am fulfilling what God has called me to do, and he is fulfilling who he is. This is a beautiful and remarkable response to what could have been a jealousy-invoking situation, right? Bless John for this. And recognizing, and we must recognize the good gift of God to you. And again, you are gifted And we must recognize what others are called to do and what we are called to do. And by embracing what God has equipped us and called us and asked us to do, we will receive joy in what God, and walking in the way that God has called us, right? Have any of you ever compared yourself to somebody else? You're laughing. We all do it, right? You know, regardless of your vocation, regardless of whatever, we love to compare, right? Has that ever led to anywhere good in your life? No. What it leads to, if you're you're evaluating, oh, I'm better than him, right? What does that put in us? Thank you, right? Look at me, I'm awesome, you are awful. I am better, you peasant. You never say that. But it might be in your heart. Or if you're comparing yourself to someone else, and you're like, dang, he's a lot better than me. Where does that lead you? Uh, Discouragement, right? Depression. Have you ever wanted someone else's life? Only one of you has. (laughs) <laughs> I hear you, I hear you. <laughs> I think we all have at some point. I have. Right? I've had many times, right? That doesn't lead to anywhere good. So I want to encourage you to embrace God's good gift to you. And you can say, Dave, it doesn't seem like a gift to me. Huh? It is. You have to See it. John recognized these things in this remarkable response. So you have, been, you have been given an identity and calling. Let's continue to read now John's further response to this one who is drawing comparisons. Verse 29. John said, John the Baptist, the one who has the bride is the bridegroom. Identifying Jesus as the Christ, identifying um, who he was, right? And he says, the one who has the bride is the bridegroom. The friend of the bridegroom who stands and hears him rejoices greatly at the bridegroom's voice. Therefore, this joy of mine is now complete. Second sub point. You and I receive joy by fulfilling our calling. You receive joy by fulfilling your calling. Now, John the Baptist understood who Jesus was. Jesus was the lamb, and in this comparison, he's saying Jesus was The groom, by the way, which further points to Christ's identity. And we'll see more of that uh, later on in the sermon. Okay, saying he's the groom, the church is the bride, and he recognized the identity and calling of Christ. In so doing, this gave John the freedom to recognize, embrace his calling as the friend of the groom. 
What a great descriptor, by the way, right? That we can say, I'm a friend of the groom, right? Jesus is that groom. Being his friend, John, when he heard Jesus' voice, rejoiced, right? When I was reading this and studying on it, I really got emotional about this, right? It's like, just imagine your best friend, right? And imagine your love for this person. And imagine that they're getting ready for their wedding day. And you're so grateful for that person. And so grateful for how these two are going to be together. And you love them so much. And then you hear their voice. And you get excited. Like they're here. (laughs) What great love. John had for Christ. And I say, God, help us to love Christ and love each other, to be so excited for what God was doing in them and through them in a moment in time of their life. John had that joy. Why? Because John was fulfilling his calling. He wasn't pining away, wishing, well, I wish I was the Christ. How comes he gets everything that's good, right? Some of y'all do that. You know you do. Do you really rejoice when other people are rejoicing? Or do you curse when other people are rejoicing? That should have been me. Can't believe they got that position, that raise, that whatever, whatever. John, by understanding God's call of, on him, was rejoicing. And it says his joy was made complete in recognizing that Christ was on the scene and he was shining. God, help us to have that mentality in us. And if you are trying to fulfill someone else's gifting and calling, you will be greatly disappointed. But if you embrace how God has made you and equipped you and what opportunities he has given you, even if you're in elementary school or you are on your last lap, if you embrace that, you'll find joy in doing what God has designed and asked you to do but do that so many of us have wasted time in bitterness or discouragement or despair wishing it was different than it is stop wasting time and stop wasting the gift of God in your life You receive joy by fulfilling your calling. Therefore, this joy of mine is now complete. And then John gives us this incredible perspective. And we prayed it together. John 3.30. He must increase. But I must increase decrease. If you're going to remember anything from this sermon, remember that line, right? Hope you remember more, okay? Remember this line. So the goal of your calling and my calling and our calling ultimately is to magnify Jesus, right? This is the goal and the ultimate mission of your life that he would increase and we would decrease again this is from the mouth of john the baptist this shining star that people were coming to in droves and droves of people right he recognized his place he recognized who christ was and said may i continue to decrease and decrease and decrease and may he continue to increase and increase and increase 
That's one of the reasons why we have this balance scale up here. And thank you, Fred, for manufacturing this. Have you guys seen these? Right? You guys understand how these work? We don't use these really anymore, right? But back in the day, this is how they weighed things. They put certain weights in one side, and then they uh, balance them against something on the other side to weigh it out. This is our sermon uh, item, our prompt, okay? And so this is kind of how it works, right? If you say, I must decrease, right, putting more weight and emphasis, an element to understanding Christ working in us because he gives us both the desire and the power to fulfill his will. This is Philippians chapter 2, verse 13. If we say, it is because of Christ working in me that we are a certain way, we put credit where credit is due, which means the less we are, the more we become. Because in giving credit and understanding that Christ is working, we get joy in recognizing that all we need to do is to say yes to him. Right? To pray to him. And you recognize, hey, anything I do of any value is because of God's spirit working in me. And that is true. And by giving credit to where credit is due, God says, well done, my good and faithful servant right and as we become less we <laughs> become more welcome to the kingdom of god john understood that john wasn't trying to grasp onto something and if you read philippians chapter 2 jesus wasn't hanging on to the glory of the godhead right he let it go Become made in human likeness. Being made as a sermon, as a, a sermon, <laughs> a servant, giving himself on a cross, right? It's descending into greatness. John understood that and recognized that he must increase and I must decrease. Let God help us to think this way. That our goal and our calling is not to magnify us, not to exalt us, to not have people just look at us, right? You're going to get in trouble, friend. And ultimately, it's not about you. God, help us to understand this about ourselves. In relationship to Jesus. So now let's turn, right? As John assesses this somewhat difficult situation and this comparison, we learn things about John, but ultimately we learn things about us, and ultimately we learn things about Christ. Now John now focuses the attention on Jesus' identity and calling. Now let's listen to what John the Baptist says here in verse 31. Let's continue to read. He who comes from above is above all. Right? Talking about Christ. He who is of the earth belongs to the earth and speaks in an earthly way. He who comes from heaven is above all. He bears witness to what he has seen and heard. Yet no one receives his testimony. Now, whoever receives his testimony sets his seal to this, that God is true. For he whom God has sent utters the words of God. For he gives the Spirit without measure. Significant things, right? John identifying that he was a voice and that now Jesus is the voice and identifies now more fully who this Jesus was. Number one, that Jesus is above all things. And Jesus is indeed above all things because he is before all things. Jesus is from heaven. He does not belong to this earth 
nor does he come from the earth. And in him and by him and for him, all things hold together. And I have a bunch of scriptures and lots of places in here to back what I'm saying up. John recognized his gifting and calling and his place. He recognized that ultimately he is to give Christ glory. And he recognized now saying Jesus in comparison, he's above all things. And Jesus' is calling, okay, you see what he's going to do here, was to bear witness to what he has seen and heard. Again, pointing to Jesus, to bear witness for what he's seen and heard. And Jesus did that in his ministry. That Jesus' calling is to show people that God is true. And Jesus' calling is to utter the words of the Father. And Jesus' calling is to give the Spirit without measure, to change the hearts and give eternal life to all who come to Him. This is who Jesus is. And this is what Jesus does. John the Baptist was pointing to him. John the Apostle was pointing to him. All scriptures point to him. All creation points to him. Understand Jesus, that he is above all things and worthy of our praise, worthy of our allegiance, worthy of our honor, worthy of all of these things. John knew this. And wants us to understand this. And now he goes on in verse 35 saying, The Father, which is God the Father, loves the Son, which is Jesus. And has given all things into his hand. Not only is Jesus above all things, but Jesus has been given all things. The Father loves the Son in a way that is unique to Jesus. Now, does God the Father love you? The answer is, yeah, He does. He calls us into His family, and we are adopted into His family, the family of God, through belief, through what Christ has done for us. He loves the Son eternally, in existence, never created, always in fellowship besides for a moment on the cross. He loves the Son uniquely. And at Jesus' baptism, unlike no other baptism, the Father declared, This is my Son, whom I loved who I love and I am well pleased. Listen to him. John recognized the unique nature of Christ. And the writers, writer of Hebrews writes this for us. This is an amazing passage about Christ. I'm going to bring us over there just for a moment. Hebrews 1. This is what is written to us about Christ. Saying... Long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But now, in these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom also he created the world. Jesus is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature, and he upholds the universe by the word of his power. Now, after making purifications for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become as much superior to angels as the name he has inherited is more excellent than theirs. So the Father has gladly and rightly given all things into the hands of his Son, including your very life. Given it to Jesus. And all authority in heaven and earth has been given to him. Jesus is the Lord of both the dead and the living. 
He is the Alpha and the Omega. He's the first and the last. He is the beginning and the end. And we are His and He is ours. He knows you. He has not forgotten you. You haven't slipped out and through His fingers and like, oh, I lost one. Doesn't work that way. He holds on to us. He holds us fast. Like a good dance holding us throughout the seasons of life. Jesus is above all things, and he holds everything in his hands. And then he comes down to this point that we've seen time and time and time and time and time and time again. Verse 36, whoever believes in the Son has eternal life, and whoever does not obey the Son Shall not see life. The wrath of God remains on him. Last final sub point. Whoever believes in Jesus has eternal life. Now notice in this verse, right? And we've seen this before, but it's a little bit different here. Whoever believes in the Son of God, if you can go back to that verse, whoever believes in, there it is, whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. Now, whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life. So there's this interplay between believes in and obey. Do you see that? Saying that this is the same thing. You could say, whoever obeys the Son has eternal life, and whoever does not believe in the Son shall not see life. Or you could say, whoever believes in the Son has eternal life, and whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life. Because there is a connection, like we talked about last week, between believing in And obeying. Do you see that? Right? Know who else believes that Jesus is the Son of God? Thank you. The devil. Right? He believes in the identity of who Jesus is. Does the devil obey Jesus? No, he goes against it. And so, John again is telling all people, understand who this Jesus is. And to a degree, understand who we are. And, and you see this, and it, we talked about it and read about it. And go back and read the chapter, please do, Right? That if we believe in the Son, we get eternal life. And belief means follow, obey, put trust in, put your hope in, put your confidence in. Follow Jesus. That's the difference. And if you believe in, you obey. That's why our mission statement right from Romans chapter 1 verse 5 We exist to bring about the obedience of him, not faith. You see that? Thank you for that. Because belief in has fruit from, right? Do you hear me? Roots going deep in Christ, trusting him and what he's done. When roots go deep, Fruits go up. We don't do good things to be saved. We do good things because we are saved. 
Are, are you hearing me? Whoever believes in Jesus, the one from above, the one who has everything in his hands, whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. Whoever does not obey the Son, not going to see it. But the wrath of God, the right, just wrath of God because of our rebellion against God. God, both external and internal, remains on him. And time and time and time and time again, we'll see that. But our trust in him, and I'm going back to this quote I started up, uh, started with this morning. And this is from a preacher, John Piper. And think about this. God is most glorified in us. And hopefully, as you are a Christian, you say, I want God to be glorified in me. I hope you want that. I hope you want to say, I want Jesus to be magnified, glorified, similar word, same meaning. Right? I want him to be glorified. Well, how best we do that? By being satisfied in Christ. If I went around and asked you, are you satisfied in Christ? How would you answer that question? It's a good question. Regardless of your ability or lack of ability. Regardless of your bank account. Regardless of your energy level. Regardless of the stress and the weight that you feel. And you all are carrying things. You all carry stuff. I carry stuff. How do we get that? Well, we recognize our gifting and calling. We recognize his gifting and his calling. And then in joyful submission to him in communion with him as a good friend, say, God, thank you that you will never leave me and forsake me. God, thank you for how you've made me. That's actually a good prayer, by the way. When's the last time you prayed, God, thank you for making me how I am? Most of you probably have never prayed that. Thank you for that. <laughs> Maybe some of you prayed that too much. <laughs> I'll just look at it like, yes, sir. <laughs> Lenny's down here is like, yeah, that's right. I see you, Lenny. I see you. <laughs> There's a balance, buddy. And then thanking him for who he is and recognizing that he will never leave you, forsake you. He's got you. He's got you. And then we can be satisfied with the calling. And sometimes it's heavy. Sometimes it's hard. John the Baptist went on and continued to minister. He was calling out sin. And he ended them in jail. Ended getting his head cut off. But he was satisfied. And his joy was great, I'm sure, when he finally got to go home. So we're ending our service with communion. And if the mis uh, musicians would come up, that would be awesome. And so think about what we've talked about today. And I hope that something has hit you today. Maybe you're struggling with your identity and your place and your calling, all right? I encourage you to thank God for that. Maybe you don't understand quite who Jesus is. Look at him again today. Reread those words today. Maybe this scale will stick with you 10 years from now, and I hope it does. I may decrease and may he increase and so we're going to turn to communion and I'm going to pray before we do so we're going to sing some stuff so let's just pray together now let's do that so father here we are your children in this place God I'm grateful for how you've made each and every person 
God, I'm also astounded by your Spirit's work in John the Baptist and his recognition and his joy in seeing the Savior. God, we acknowledge the supremacy and the greatness of the one whose name is above all names. That Jesus truly is the King of all kings, truly is the Lord of all lords, <coughs> is both the beginning where all things stemmed and the end who knows all things and is for all things. God, I pray for my friends in this room today that may at least something that from this service will stick in our spirits. And Jesus, may we have um, the heart of John the Baptist in recognition of your surpassing greatness points to you and said, may he increase forever and ever and ever. And may we decrease in sight of the glories which are in Christ. We recognize your sovereignty, your supremacy. We recognize your goodness to us. Help us as we renew our faith through communion to continue to believe in by obeying you and following after you. In Jesus' name, amen.